I hope you all are doing well this morning, and uh, if you would, bow your hearts with me this morning as we open up in a word of prayer before we dig in to God's word. Father God, this morning, we ask that your name alone is lifted up. We ask that you receive all the honor and the glory and the power that you rightly deserve. So God, I pray that you would open our ears to your word, that you would open our eyes to see clearly what you expect of your children, your beloved, your bride. And God, I pray that my words would decrease so that your spirit can increase and work in a way that only your spirit can work in our hearts. We ask this in your mighty and powerful name, amen. So, for those of you that are new with us this morning, we are continuing our series titled Flipped, and it is a study on the Sermon on the Mount, and it has been an incredible journey as we walk through what Jesus expects of all of his disciples. And man, there are so many times looking at what Jesus tells us that I, it is a gut check for me, because Jesus' words tell us, are we on track as God's citizens? Or are we off track? And his Sermon on the Mount is saying, look, as Jesus' disciples, this is what I can work out in your life. This is the characteristics and attitudes that you will have if you depend on my mercy and my grace. And in today's passage, this one is no different. It gives us a challenge. And so, church, I know all of you are smart, right? All of you are smart in here this morning. You guys are a smart church. You're here. So how many of you can tell me, what is this? It's a heart. Wow, see? I told you guys are smart. Now, what is the heart a symbol for? I heard Valentine's Day, but then I heard the word. It is for love, right? And love is awesome. We see the heart everywhere, and it always stands for this symbol of love. And in our society, we can love many things. Even individually in our own lives, we love many different things. We can love things. We can love objects. We can love ideas. We can love feelings. We can love people. And so I just want to do, and when we love those things, this is the coolest thing. It's cool to me. Maybe not be cool to you. But uh, when we see those things, it makes our heart light up. Isn't that cheesy? Isn't that cheesy? Our hearts light up with things we love. So let's see if there's anyone in here who loves some of these things. So uh, puppies. Who loves puppies? Right? Puppies? Yep. Some of you don't like puppies because they chew your shoes in your house. Um, then we'll put the next one up here. Pizza. How many pizza lovers? Now, who did I just make hungry? Who did I make hungry? A lot of people. I apologize. Now, how many of you love seeing an elderly couple in love? It's precious. It's sweet. They're in love. It's amazing. That's what it should be. That's what we should desire for our marriages. Okay, what about this one? Uh, the NFL. Who loves the NFL? Mmm. Yep, yep. And then I threw this last one in just because llamas. Who loves llamas? Anyone love llamas? A few? That's what I look like when I wake up in the morning. So it's what Kelly has to look forward to every day. Now, not only can our hearts love and our hearts can open up to things that we love, to people that we love, but then something happens with our hearts that were designed and created to love, our hearts can also be full of hate. And that light that, li that shines in our hearts that makes us feel this love can actually be squelched out. And so there are some things in this world that we can hate. And so I'll put some of these things up. You might not be the same. How many of you hate getting cut off in traffic? So I have a picture here for you. How many? Right? That's one thing. That's, I don't know why. It just makes me mad. I don't know why. I don't understand what it is. When someone cuts me off, that's like my face. Uh, how many of you hate cockroaches? <laughs> like, I'm going to tell you, realize, I mean, you notice that's not a real picture, right? I tried to put a real picture, and I was horrified by what I was looking at, so I went with a cartoon, because I, it's a long story, but I do not like those things. When I was two, I think I tried to eat them, and my mom said, yuck, 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 and so what I think about when I see a roach is yuck, 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 and I get paralyzed, so I hate those. Uh, let's, let's move on to the next one. Sunburn, right? How many of you hate getting sunburn? Right? Terrible, horrible experience. What about this one, drinking orange juice after brushing your teeth? How many of you hate doing that? It's a very bad experience. It's no bueno. Um, 
And then, here's the next one. How many of you hate your enemy? Mm. Mm. Now, you don't have to raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. But, you see, how many of us find it very easy to hate our enemies? Right? When somebody does something that offends you and attacks you, your first response is, I hate you. And you find people that say, I hate that person over there. This person did this. I hate them. And it's easy. Our hearts are filled with love. But in worst case scenarios, our heart can be filled with hate towards other people. And whatever the reason is, we get these things in our heart where when an enemy enters into our life, we end up hating them and the love is gone towards our enemies. And it's with this conflict in our hearts that Jesus says, your hearts were designed to love. I have saved you, redeemed you, sanctified you, glorified you to love But my disciples have this conflict where they want to love certain people and hate their enemies. And the worst case is sometimes in our life, we justify our hatred. Well, you don't know what they did. I deserve to hate them. Look at what they did. And we have a whole list and we have subpoints and plots and we have all this stuff to justify our hatred. And Jesus this morning addresses this idea of loving our enemies. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be in the last few verses of chapter 5. And we're going to look at what Jesus has to say about loving our enemies. He says this in verse 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And so this morning, Jesus tells us we are to love our enemies. But before we dive in and dig in really and unpack this, I want to, I kind of want to remind you of the situation that Jesus' disciples were under. The religious leaders, we've looked at, this is the sixth time that Jesus has told his disciples, you've heard your religious leaders teach you this, but now I'm telling you what it really is and what God really expects. And his religious, these religious leaders had taken upon themselves where they looked at God's word and said, I like this, I don't like this, so we're not going to teach this. We're only going to teach this here and what we like and what fits our agenda. And so they looked at God's word, and when it came to loving their enemies, they added their own twist to their enemies and said, well, we're going to do what's easiest for us. And we're only going to take and choose what fits our things. And the other five that we've looked at is, Jesus said, look, lusting is adultery, right? You are not to seek revenge. You are not to be full of anger. You are supposed to be people of integrity, not lying everywhere to everyone. And so Jesus had to already correct so many wrong uh, interpretations that the Pharisees and religious leaders had of God's word. And in this case, it is no different. He has to correct them. And so Jesus wants us to have the proper understanding of loving our enemies. And I put it this way in my notes. The very first thing is this, is love without limits. Love without limits. You might be saying, Brad, what does it mean to love without limits? Are we really supposed to love everyone Even our enemies, the one who hates us, the one who does bad things against us, are we really supposed to love them without limits? Well, let's let Jesus talk. Let's let Jesus give the answer to that. He said in verse 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, our role as pastors is to help everybody in this room 
learn how to dig into God's Word, to unpack it so you can learn what it is to really get meaning out of God's Word. And so this morning, I'm going to give you a little bit of insight into what I sat down and did as I studied and as I walked through the text, because this way you guys can learn, how can I go deeper? How can I dig in? It's our roles to show you. So can I invite you in on that process? You got, you're with me? All right. So the very first thing as I did is I, I sat down, I looked at this, and I said, you always want to start with what the author, Jesus, in this case is Jesus. What is, this, what is Jesus saying here? What did the author mean by why he put it here? What is he really saying? Once you get what the author is saying, you keep your verse in context. Because what happens, if you don't do that, then you could be like the Pharisees and just pick stuff that fits what you want it to say. And that's not what we're to do here this morning. We have to look at what the writer really said. So here's a couple questions I asked myself. I said, have you ever seen in Scripture, love your neighbor, yeah, I've seen that. We read it. There's something in the Old Testament. It's over five times in the New Testament. I've seen that there. And then I asked my follow-up question. Okay, I've seen that one. But what about seeing, love your neighbor, but then hate your enemy? Has that ever been displayed in Scripture anywhere? So I sat there and thought about it. No, i never seen that. So then my next question was, is then where did Jesus get this? Where did Jesus get, love your neighbor and hate your enemy? Who was teaching this? Where did this idea come from? I want you to turn in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 19. There's a cool thing, if you, if you have a Bible or a study Bible, or maybe you just have a, a regular Bible, one thing I would really recommend is a cross-reference Bible. Because as you're reading, it'll have a little letter next to the verse, and it'll tell you different passages, and those references help you understand. And in this case, it gives you a reference right to Leviticus, so you can go back and tie in what is really being said. And in Leviticus 19, verse 18, this is what it says. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You see the same phrase? You shall love your neighbor? You see it there? This is where the religious leaders got the first part of that verse right. They love your neighbor. They see that. They got that. In verse 2 of that same chapter, God told Moses, hey, I need you to speak to the people of Israel, and I need you to tell them that they are to be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. And so he goes through this whole chapter of Leviticus 19, you can read it later, where, Jesus, where, uh, where God speaks through Moses and tells his people, this is how you treat your neighbors. This is how you treat the ones that are of your own nation. Here's how you treat the ones that are a part of your uh, uh, country. Treat them well. Treat them like you would want to be treated. But here's where the Israelites messed up, is they took that as love your neighbor as yourself to mean, I only love those that are Israelites. And anyone who is not an Israelite, I do not have to love them. And they picked and they chose and decided, I'm only going to love those that are of my own nation. So where do the Israelites get the idea of hating your enemy? If you've read scripture, you've read through the Old Testament, you see that they had enemies, the Canaanites, the Philistines, and other nations. And there were times where God told Israel, destroy them, conquer them, wipe them out. There are even some Psalms where David is praying against his enemies. And the Israelites thought, well, the religious leaders thought, well, you know what? Since God told us to kill those people then, since David was praying, then that means God wants us to do the exact same thing so we hate our enemies. But what they failed to understand is that God was not being prescriptive or giving a rule when he told them to destroy the nations. That was God's divine justice being played out at his time on his call. And what the religious leaders did was they said, you know what? We know God said it then, but I'm going to do it in my personal life. So anybody who doesn't like me, I hate you. And they took what was descriptive and made it prescriptive in their life and made it a rule when God nowhere said you are to hate your enemies and to hate those that are outside of your nation. So the Israelites, the religious leaders, brought this idea into play. And there was a a sect of the Qumran sect during Jesus' time. And here's what they said. This is what was their view. They said it this way, love the brother, hate the outsider. And that was being taught during Jesus' time. Love the brother, 
hate the outsider. But this is not what God's word ever taught. You see, Israel even left off, there was an important phrase that it said there in Leviticus 19. You shall love your neighbor as what? As yourself. So the Israelites became exclusive with their love. They decide, I'm only going to love those that I want to love. Here's the next thing I put in my notes. I said it this way. Inclusive, not exclusive. Our love for our enemies is to be inclusive, not exclusive. Well, well, how do I know that? Israel had the wrong interpretation. Let's look at God's word to find out. In Leviticus, the same chapter, 19, jump down to verse 33 and 34. Look at what God tells his people, the Israelites. When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among him, and you shall love him as what? Yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. They were told by God to treat those outside the nation of Israel as they would treat themselves. And I don't think it's coincidence that when Jesus said, here's what you've been taught, love your neighbor, that there was a whole part of that that was missing. And I don't believe it was just an accident. This is, why do you think the Israelites left off as yourself? Because it's hard. If we love somebody as ourself, that means we have to actually care about them. That means we have to put aside our wants, our wills, our desires, what we think we need so that the other person is treated well like we would want to be treated. And you see, we as sinful people, and Jesus understands, yes, we are redeemed and we're saved when we put our faith in Christ, but we have our sinful nature. And if we don't get our sinful nature under God's grace and mercy, we become selfish and everything comes about us. And when somebody doesn't meet our standards of what we think of how we should be treated, we don't want to treat them with any respect and love. And the Israelites, the religious leaders, were no different. They left it off, treat your neighbor as yourself, because they knew it would be hard to do. They wanted to hold on to their venge vengeful ways. They wanted to hold on to their anger. They wanted to hold on to their hatred. They wanted to gossip. They wanted to be mean. It's fun to be mean. And they wanted to hold on to that. So they teach half-truths from God's word. And Jesus wants to correct our understanding. And look at there in Leviticus 19, 34. Why does God want us to love those that are outsiders? Look at the reason he gave. Because you were once slaves in Egypt. Because here's what we need to understand about our enemies. We've been under the bondage of sin, those of us who place our faith in Christ. We've been in that place where they are, and we've been rescued, we've been redeemed, we've been set free from every sin, every shame, every guilt. God has rescued us, and these people that are our enemies, most of them are trapped in sin. And God says, look, you are going to love those outside because you too were once enslaved, and now you've seen the freedom that is in me. Please share that freedom and love with those that are outside of those that you love. So we love our enemies. Look at Exodus chapter 23. Look at what it says here about our enemy. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall bring it back to him. Uh, excuse me, time out, what? I'm helping my enemy out? Let's go on. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying down under its burden, you shall refrain from leaving him with it. You shall rescue it with him. Look at the example God expects of his people, his citizens, his children. He wants us to help our enemy. Does he really expect that? Yes, he really expects us to do that. Jesus is not teaching us anything new when he says, love your neighbor. When he says, love your enemies, he's not teaching us something that is new or different. This is something God has always expected of his children, Israel. But what Israel never did was to love others and be a light to the world. And Jesus tells us we are to be a light to the world. And how do we do that? First and foremost, we love our enemies. Proverbs 25, 21, and 22 says this. If your enemy is hungry, 
give him bread to eat. Aid if he is thirsty, give him water to drink, for you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. God expects us to treat our enemies the way that God has treated us. He wants us to actually help and care and love our enemies. Even though it's hard, even though it fights against everything in your being, we have to remember what God has done for us. You see, notice when God says how to treat your enemy, he doesn't say gossip about them to others. Notice he doesn't say curse at them. Notice he doesn't say flip them off, fight them, blast them on social media, or pray evil things against them. But is that not what we naturally do when somebody becomes our enemy? We decide that we're going to get back at them and we're going to do the same thing against them that they've done to us. But God says that will not be so with my people. With my people, my kingdom, my children, you will love your enemies, not hate your enemies. Now let me clarify what I'm not saying is that God expects us to have them as besties and to have them living in our house and do all those things unless God calls you to that. But we are called, whenever an enemy comes and attacks us and has ill will against us, our response is love every time. Love every time. When they curse you, respond in love. When they say evil things about you, respond in love. When they mock you for your faith, respond in love. You see, God wants us to respond to enemies with love instead of revenge, hatred, and vengeance. Next thing I put in my notes is this. Love for our enemies leads to action. He says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. There are several different words used for love in the New Testament, and in this case, Jesus used the word agape. And this word agape, is a, it's a word where it, is a, uh, it implies action and seeking the highest welfare of somebody else. It is a word that always implies action. You are seeking the highest welfare of somebody else. And this is what Jesus uses for love your enemies. That means you are seeking the highest welfare for your enemies. In 1 Corinthians 13, all 15 characteristics of love are all in the verb form, right? Love hopes all things, love bears all things, love rejoices in truth, love endures all things. All of those those actions of love are all verbs. This love that we have for our enemies implies action. It's never just a feeling. It's never just a thought. Sometimes we think, well, I'm going to love them. I, I love them. But that thought never leads to action. That's not the love Jesus is talking about. The love Jesus is talking about is it will lead to actions in your life, to love that enemy that is in your life. Jesus says in John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And this was after Jesus had washed his disciples' feet. So Jesus' love that he caused his disciples to, to demonstrate to the world has always been a love about action. And as we see in this case, love isn't just for those who are part of our family, our church family, or God's kingdom. Our love is to be demonstrated in action towards our enemies as well. 1 John 3, 16 and 18 says this, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Little children, let us us not love in word or talk, but in what? Deed and in truth. Too many times we love in thought. And Jesus says that's not far enough. That's not good enough. Your love must lead to action, where you are demonstrating the love of God to them. In that verse, it says that we are told to lay down our lives. What does that mean? See, most of the time when you get upset at somebody who's an enemy, they some, they've done something against you about how you feel you should have been treated. And we don't get what we thought we deserved. And here's what it means. We don't look for what we deserve. We lay our deserving rights, whatever those little things might be, And we say, I'm seeking to meet the needs and to love those. I'm putting my desires aside. I'm putting my will aside. I'm putting my life aside so that I can love other people. That's the kind of love God wants us to demonstrate towards our enemies. You see, all of us are going to have different enemies in our life. We're all not going to have the same. It could be a boss. 
could be a coworker, could be a family member, could be a spouse. It could be all sorts of things, but Jesus tells us our response is always the same. It's always to love them through our actions. But how do we love somebody that's our enemy? How, how, how do we go about that? Because when somebody becomes our enemy, our first response is not to love them. So how do we do that? There's only one way. Look at what Jesus says. Uh, you shall, uh, if you look back at verse, uh, I just lost it, verse 44. But I say to you, love your enemies, and look what he connects with it, and pray for those who persecute you. Love that leads to action for your enemies always starts with prayer. It continues through prayer. It ends in prayer. That Jesus intentionally connects our love for enemies with prayer. Why? Because prayer is not just, oh, dear Jesus, please change their sinful attitudes. Prayer changes us. And when you pray, God gives you the ability, the grace, the power, and the strength to love your enemies when everything in your sinful nature wants to act out in anger and in vengeance. So Jesus says the way that we begin to love is to pray for our enemies. And it's not praying that God would punish them. It's not praying that God would destroy them, that God would give them something crazy. No, we don't do that. We literally pray that God would step in and rescue their soul because that's what they are in desperate need of. And when you begin to pray for somebody's soul, it changes you. When you look at them the way God does, God doesn't see people as just all the bad things they, that they do. God sees them as created in his image. They are valuable, they're worthy, and they're lost. And he loves them even when they shake their fists. God, you're not real. God, I hate you. He loves them. Why? Because he cares about their soul, not what they do. You see, we attach what people do to who they are. But when you pray for their soul, it changes you. Not right away. It takes time. It's something daily you have to pray. So God gives you the proper perspective. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a pastor in, in Nazi Germany. And he was, uh, and one of the things that he mentioned was on this idea of praying for your enemies. And he was eventually killed by the Nazis. But look at this quote that he says. He says, this is the supreme demand. Through the medium of prayer, we go to our enemy, stand by his side, and plead for him to God. See, notice Bonhoeffer didn't say, God, please make them stop being mean. Please make them stop being rude. He pleads for their soul before God Almighty. That's our prayer when we pray for our enemies. It's not a selfish one. It's not God get vengeance back. It's God, save this person's soul. Rescue them from this sin that is in their life. I know I've had many times in my life I had a, I had a, was a friend of mine, then became an enemy of mine. Just, you ever have people that are sandpaper in your life? Like, they just, it starts out great, but then after a while it just really irritates, and it's like, man, like, I just can't, like, I'm in your presence, and I can't stand to be in your presence, because uh, you rub me wrong. It's terrible. Well, that happened. And this friend, he became an enemy of mine, and we hated each other. We almost got into a fight one day, all this kind of stuff. It was crazy. But I remember that um, as God was maturing me and helping me in my walk with, with him, he brought that, that person to my mind. And I began to say, you know what, I'm being an idiot. Because, you know, it's what I was. I was holding on to how I felt he should have treated me. So I just began to say, you know what, God, I need you to change my attitude towards him. I need you to change my heart towards him. And uh, he had, we were working at the same place, and he ended up quitting. But then um, from that moment on, as God began to change my heart, I would see him periodically. He would come back into the work, and I would just begin to talk to him and be nice. Even though my flesh on the inside was, you don't like him. I was like, but God's changing me. But you don't like him, but God's changing me. Be quiet. And over time, you know, I got to the place where I did not hate him anymore. That whatever it was, I don't even care what he did to me. It doesn't matter anymore. Because here's what I realized. I blew my opportunity to be a witness to him. I blew my opportunity to demonstrate the love of God and God's grace to him because I was selfish and didn't get what I wanted. But as you pray for them, I know it's true. God will change your heart towards them. We love our enemies and follow our Father's example. 
we are demonstrating, we are giving evidence to the fact that we are citizens of God's kingdom, that we show that we have been changed, that we have been redeemed. John 13, 35 says it this way, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Your love for one another, in this case this morning, it includes your enemies, will demonstrate that you are one of God's children. I love the way that 1 John 4, 7, and 8 says it. He says it this way. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Now, these are strong statements from the disciple John. He says, if you love others and you love them, you're demonstrating that you're from God because God himself is love. But look at what he says. But if anyone does not love... Look at what he says. And if anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Now, here's what I'm not saying, and here's what John's not saying. If you, if you have faith in Christ and you're one of his children, you're not going to lose your salvation if you're not loving. But here's what he says. It doesn't make sense for any Christian who knows God and the God who is love, who then doesn't love, that doesn't make sense. And for us to be, say, we are God's children, But do you love your enemies? No. Do you love others around you? No. Then it doesn't make sense. How can these things be? How can you know the God who is love and have hate towards everyone in your life? It doesn't add up. And here's what Jesus is telling us. As his people, we know God, God who is love. Our attitudes and hearts should be given towards loving those, and in this case this morning, showing love to our enemies. When we have love for our enemies... We demonstrate our identity as God's sons and daughters. Here's the next thing I put in my notes. Love is given unconditionally. Love is given unconditionally. Is this principle hard to follow? To give love to our enemies unconditionally? As I'm prepping all week, it's very convicting. Because I want, people, I want to love people naturally, sinfully. I want to love people under my conditions. And Jesus tells us we are to love them unconditionally. So what does it look like? Do we not see this? I love my enemies if they ask for forgiveness. I'll love my enemies if they do something nice for me first. I'll I'll, I'll love my enemies if they admit they're wrong. I'll love my enemies if they see my perspective. Once they see it my way, we're good. I'll love my enemies if they make it right. I'll love my enemies if they make it up to me. I'll love my enemies if they meet every condition that I have for them. That's our sinful nature. That's sin. That's wrong. Here's what Jesus says. That is not the example our Heavenly Father has set before us. Well, how do I know that? Romans 5, 8. What does it say? But God shows his love for us, for while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, the Bible doesn't say that we were good friends with God and then he saved us. The Bible says that in our unsaved, sinful state, We are enemies of God. We were rebellious. The Bible goes so far and says there is none good, no, not one. Everything in our life was against God. We were enemies. We wanted nothing to do with God. There's people that curse God, that hate him, that say all sorts of evil against him. We did that in our own lives. And God still sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. Why? Because of his love for us. That is the example our Father has said. Is we couldn't meet any condition of God. That was the point of why Jesus had to come. We couldn't be good enough. The best we could do is sin, people. And while we were in our sin not meeting any of the conditions of God's standards, God sent Jesus to die in our place to give us forgiveness of sins and offer us his grace through faith in him. See, that's the example our Father set and says you love unconditionally because remember, I loved you unconditionally when you wanted nothing to do with me. Love your enemies. They don't have to meet any conditions first. Love them. That's our Father's example. Psalm 145, 15 and 16 says it this way. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. He provides for everyone, and he satisfies every living thing unconditionally. We must be like our Father in loving our enemies. Here's the third thing in our notes, and we'll finish in just a few minutes. Love sets us apart. Love sets us apart. 
Matthew 5, 46 and 47 says it this way, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Here's the next thing I put in my notes. The world's love is normal. The world's love is normal. What Jesus says in those two verses is an ouch. It hurts. Because it hits us between the eyes. We find it very easy to love those who love us. The friends that we have, it's very easy to love them because they're our friends. But to love our enemies, it's difficult for us to do. But here's what Jesus says. He, he points out tax collectors and, and the Gentiles. Why does he point those out? Because tax collectors were hated by the Jews. Why? Because they were collecting taxes, but not only that, but they were working for the enemy, which was the Roman Empire. And so they detested these tax collectors who were working for the Roman Empire. Then they hated the Roman Empire because they were the Roman Empire. They were not the nation of Israel. And so Jesus points out that, look, if you only love those who love you and only greet those who are your brothers and your sisters and your family and your nation, check this out, you are just like the Roman Empire and the tax collectors that you hate. You are loving just like them. And what is their love? Their love is normal. You see, the world's love, Jesus has called us to be different. He's called us to stand out. He's called us to be the light to the world. And so we, to be the light means we have to be different. We can't love like the world loves, and that's normal. How will they ever know the love of God if we love people the way the rest of the world loves? The one thing people are missing in their life is love. And if we demonstrate the same love the world has, we are no different than the world. We're normal. And God has not saved us, redeemed us, sanctified us, glorified for us to be normal. He has called us to be the light to the world. So how are we normal? We're normal when we love those who love us. We're normal when we gossip about, about, about others. We are normal when we cuss somebody out. We're normal when we fight somebody. We're normal when we get even. We're normal when we choose to hate our enemy instead of loving our enemies. And I could go on and on and on and on. That's what normal people do. But God has called us to be completely different. Here's the next thing in our notes. God's love is supernatural. So God has called us to love supernaturally. God has called us to, to be supernatural when it comes to the love that we demonstrate to the world. Matthew 5, 16 says this, in the same way, let your light shine before men so that when they see your good works, they may give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Your love should shine as a light to a dark, lost, hurting world that needs to be loved. Your enemies, at the end of the day, need to be loved. They can see the grace and the love of God when we begin to love our enemies the way God has loved us. And when you do that, your love is supernatural. That is different, it blows people away, they won't understand it. Have you seen the people who, uh, uh, a parent whose child has been murdered? There was a story where this guy flew across the country just so he could tell the convicted murderer of his child, I forgive you. That's supernatural, folks. That's not normal. And you can sit back and say, I could never do that. You're right, because that's a divine act of God working in your life. Here's a quote from Alfred Plummer. He says it this way, to return evil for good is devilish. To return good for good is human, in other words, normal. But to return good for evil is what? It's divine. It is an act of God's grace working in your heart. Jesus ends this section with this, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. The word perfect meaning completion, meaning maturity. When it comes to loving our enemies, it means to be perfect in this sense of we need to be mature, but you might look at it and say, Brad, that's impossible. And that's the point. Is that in your own power, your own strength, the best we can do is normal. But when we submit to God and say, God, you are the God of the impossible. With man, this is impossible. With me, this is impossible. But with you, God, it is possible. Do your work of grace. Create in me a heart that loves my enemies. When you rely on God's strength, his grace, his power, you will love supernaturally. But if you disconnect yourself from the power and the source of God, you will love normally and be just like the rest of the world. And that's what the Israelites had done. Because here's what happens. When you hate your enemy, you're disconnected from God. Because you're not praying. You're not seeking his perspective. You're not seeking his vision. You're not seeking his love. And Jesus says, we are to love supernaturally. And the only way we can do that is to fall at the hands of God and say, God, do this grace in my heart. Change me.